We're going to start a a brand new series today, and this series has kind of been born out of um, a growing reality that that I've been facing, that I've been seeing kind of show up in our lives, and I wonder if you've seen it too in our community. And what I've been been watching, we're now just about two years from the start of this pandemic, and in many ways the the crisis part is over, uh, the survival part is kind of over, but we're just beginning to learn the impact of COVID on our emotional health and on our relational health. And what we're seeing is that um, there is this significant shortage of frontline workers throughout the United States. And when we say frontline workers, we mean people in healthcare and social services and education, um, that people are just getting tired and frustrated and burned out after two years of living through a crisis and a pandemic. And what's happening is that in many ways, <clears throat> the social services and healthcare and frontline workers, that they're just starting to leave significantly from these roles that some of them have held their whole lives. I had a conversation with just one former frontline healthcare worker who from the time she was about 12 years old felt like, um, she was called in to, to nursing specifically and to help people in that way and the helping professions. So she spent all kinds of time in high school and then college and even a master's degree in nursing. And she, 29 years old, she just walked away about three months ago because she was just so exhausted, and so discouraged, and so disillusioned with the state of our country. The, we'll call it... Um, the compassion fatigue is the word I want to use. And when we talk about compassion fatigue, what I mean is um, it, it's kind of the barometer of our emotional energy. So would you just take a moment, because we've all um, lived through COVID, unless you've been asleep for the last two years. Um, we've all lived through COVID. We've all dealt with um, the realities of this crisis. We've all done things in survival mode, um, just to keep ourselves moving forward. And doing those things in survival mode, I read this 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 past week, um, the very same things that that helped us in survival mode can hurt us when we get back into real life. And so let me ask you, and just for you personally, I'm not gonna ask you to put your hands up or um, to text me anything, but where would you put yourself on the scale of compassion fatigue in your own life? Where do you find yourself? Do you find yourself empty? Are you below you? You're just putting along, hoping for like the next gas station, right? Do you feel um, filled up? Like, are you coming out of a season where, where you feel like God's blessed you with an abundance of emotional energy? And if so, um, let's talk next week. Um, not to make you feel guilty, but I'm seeing this compassion fatigue that is happening, and it's not just in the context of frontline workers. It's not just social workers, it's not just healthcare, it's not just education, it's not just those helping environments, but it's throughout our entire society. It's throughout our entire community. And um, my prayer, my prayer is that together we will be able to address this issue of compassion fatigue, not just for our deeply needed frontline workers, but for us as followers of Christ. And so what I I've, what I've feel like God's been putting on our hearts, my heart specifically for the last couple months, is that we need to take some time together to understand the compassion of Jesus Christ. I mean, think about this. Have you, have you ever wondered how it was that Jesus was able to demonstrate so much love and so much compassion over and over and over again in the midst of so much pain. Just a short look at at the life of Jesus. He encountered so many people in so much pain, and yet he continued to demonstrate compassion. And that's what we're going to spend the next five weeks looking at this morning. I want to give us a definition for compassion fatigue. I found this um, actually on uh, one of the U.S. government websites, and it says, compassion fatigue is stress resulting from overexposure to at-risk or traumatized individuals. So, 
Um, I don't know if you know this, but for the last two years, most of us, in some way, shape, or form, were at risk or traumatized. And so, um, if you've been around humans and at all in the last two years, you probably have had some exposure to at risk or traumatized individuals. That when we go through a worldwide pandemic, when we begin to have the scarcity mindset around toilet paper and gasoline and bacon, right? <laughs> When, when we begin to develop these like scarcity mindsets, this fear base, this like I don't know, some of you are traumatized that bacon's now ten dollars a pound. I get it, right? Like, <laughs> me too. Okay. But in many ways, shape, or form, when you just read the definition for compassion fatigue, now, not all of us are frontline workers. Not all of us work in healthcare, or social work, or education. But the reality is, in some way, shape, or form, we've all experienced come into contact with and perhaps being overly exposed to people who are at risk or traumatized as a result of COVID. Question is, what do we do next? First thing, it starts with just realization, right? We have to recognize the signs of compassion fatigue, okay? So let me just give you five quick ones, and we're going to talk about them on and off throughout the next five weeks. But the first one is that we have an intense and prolonged sadness or grief. Does that feel anything like the last two years for you? If you've got this, like, this unrelenting sadness, this unrelenting grief, it might be. Now, I understand not, that not every sadness or grief is the direct result of compassion fatigue, but that's one of the signs. Here's another one. Avoidance of people who are hurting. Hmm. We don't do this, do we? We don't, we don't get a text and go, oh, I can't do that today. We don't get another Facebook message from a friend like, oh, no, 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 not today. If, if you combine some of these signs, right, the prolonged sadness and grief and avoidance of people who are hurting, here's the third one, the reducing of the ability to feel empathy, right? If you start just like, I, I don't have it anymore. I don't have anything more to give. I don't have any more to share. Like, you combine some of these, you're starting to understand compassion fatigue. There's a lot of this going on around the room right now. Is this resonating? I'm just wondering. Is this what you're experiencing? Because this is what I've been experiencing over the last couple of years. Here's the fourth one. Overly re negative reactions, right? If you look for a uh, hyper negative response to a, just a normal situation, guess what? You might be in compassion fatigue. And if you're sitting next to your spouse that needs to hear this one, try not to hit them, okay? Try not to elbow them, right? It's Mother's Day, so be happy or something. Um, but, but when we have this, when we have this like unusual response to a usual situation, that's the way it's described, right? When we have an unusual response to a usual situation, either we're hypersensitive or we're not sensitive enough, right? Chances are we're going through some compassion fatigue. Here's the last one. Persistent emotional and physical exhaustion. No matter how many, much time you take off, no matter how more intentional you are with your own emotional health, even if you just come back from vacation, a week later you're like, I'm exhausted, right? Combine all five of these and you may have some form of compassion fatigue. Okay, can I just ask openly and honestly, how many of you would say you have two or more of these experiences in your life right now? Okay, let me see, three or more experiences on a regular basis? Four or more? Okay, five or more, just so I know. Six or more, okay, <laughs> coming up with your own numbers. Like, I got a seven, eight, and nine I can tell you about. My guess, I'm gonna retract that statement. I don't mean my guess, what the Holy Spirit is whispering to me is that many of us are caught in this cycle of compassion fatigue. We're tired, we're lonely, we're hurting. We don't have the empathy and compassion that we should have. And dear friends, when empathy and compassion breaks down in a society, do you know what happens next? Trust is gone. You see, I, I believe that compassion <laughs> Compassion is the commodity that builds trust. That when we demonstrate compassion, when we when genuinely care for others around us, it builds trust. But when society loses trust, then we stop believing in the people around us. We stop believing in the dollar. We stop believing in the justice system. We stop believing in the education system. We stop believing in the healthcare system. Does that sound anything like what we're going through right now? When compassion drops, society wide. When compassion falls, trust falls with it. 
And when trust falls, what do we do? How do we rebuild trust in a society that no longer has compassion for each other and no longer has trust? Here's my prayer. Here's my hope. Here's your, a, a, a saying that you're going to hear me say over and over and over for the next five weeks. We must understand the compassion of Jesus Christ and tap into the compassion of Jesus Christ if we're going to combat this compassion fatigue, if we're going to rebuild trust in our communities. And I don't have it to give to you, okay? I'm just going to say it out front. I have, in one way, shape, or form, four or five of those kind of symptoms in my own life on a regular basis over this last two years, consistently. And so I don't have any more compassion to give you dear friends. And I say that humbly because I'm in the compassion business. I'm what you would consider a non-traditional frontline worker. And in and of myself, I don't have any more compassion to give. And many of you I've had this very same conversation with. I have no more empathy. I have no more grace. I have no more compassion. And so we must tap into the source of all compassion. We must tap into the source of all mercy. We must tap into the source of all grace if we're going to stem the tide of compassion fatigue in our community, in our families, in our marriages, in our everyday lives. So would you join me on this journey? Would you join me on this journey towards understanding the depth and breadth and width of the compassion that Jesus demonstrated? And we're going to take story after story for the next five weeks, and we're just going to look at the way that Jesus demonstrated compassion, and then what that means for you and I. And here's, here's something I want to be really careful with. Just stop for a second, and if you didn't hear anything I said for the last eight minutes, please hear this. This is not a self-help sermon series. This is not a self-help sermon series. If you could help yourself, you'd be fine right now, okay? If I could help myself, I'd be fine right now. We wouldn't need this series. I don't believe in self-help. I do believe in empowering the body of Christ to live compassionate lives. And so you may hear some like self-development and relational development language, but it all needs to be couched in the gospel, in the truth of Jesus Christ, the demonstration of compassion, because I believe that Jesus himself gave us the most significant demonstration of compassion that the world has ever known when he died on a cross, right? Like he showed us Compassion to the infinite degree when every single one of his friends turned their back on him. When the religious leaders of the day lied and mistreated and abused and beated, beaten him, right? Jesus demonstrated the most significant form of compassion that the world has ever known. So this is not a self-help series. This is a Jesus help series. This is us trying to lean in to the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to live lives of compassion in a world that is desperate for it right now. Okay? We good? Strap up. Here we go. Grab your Bibles. Compassion. Let's define it so that we're all together on the same thing. All right? this is, uh, this is, I believe this is from the Oxfords or Miriams. I can't remember. You can look it up later. This is the like, official definition of compassion. Sympathetic consciousness of others' distress with, with a desire to alleviate it. That sounds so not helpful for the next five, day, five weeks. <laughs> it's like, no, no, I can't, I can't get my mind wrapped around this. Sympathetic, right? So you, you, like, you have sympathy or empathy. Consciousness you're aware of, like so you feeling an awareness of someone else's pain with a desire to alleviate it. Let me, um, let me paraphrase, okay? To suffer together voluntarily, okay? Compassion is choosing to suffer with someone else voluntarily when you don't have to. You, so you see the pain of the other person, you acknowledge it, you enter into it, you come alongside of them, you bear it up under their pain with them, right? So I'm going to use this over and over and over again. This other one I gave you just so you know that I, I can read a dictionary. But this one, like, I just want to sum it up. The reality is compassion is choosing to suffer, voluntarily choosing to suffer with someone else's pain that is not your own. And friends, we've lost a lot of this in the last two years. And I don't think it's getting better in our country. I really don't. 
more than ever, the lines are being drawn. The division lines are there. And very rarely do we cross over those division lines. And sometimes we're even piercing the hearts of those on our side. Compassion is choosing to suffer together voluntarily in the midst of someone else's pain. Okay? This is what I believe Jesus did for us, and this is what I believe that he's calling us to do for each other in this season. Starting with Matthew chapter 9, I want to show you for a moment where I get this idea from that, that Jesus calls us to and demonstrated compassion. This is one of many verses. Again, we're going to take the next five weeks and unpack a bunch of different stories of Jesus demonstrating compassion. But for today, Mark chapter 9, verse 35. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Okay, so you understand the context. Jesus is visiting Cowdersport, but we didn't exist yet, right? He's just kind of going to the small towns and the villages. He's going to Austin. He's going to Emporium. He's going to Rollette. He's going to Port Allegheny, right? He's just spending time with people in the trenches, in the pain, right? Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues. Do you know, do you know what town and villages he's actually in? If you, if you look back at Mark chapter 9, you don't have to go there now, but you'll notice something, that Jesus actually, in Mark chapter 9, he starts out in his hometown. He starts out in his counter port. He starts out where he grew up, Nazareth. And he starts out in Nazareth, and then he starts moving around to all the little towns and villages and hamlets and hollows. I've learned a lot of hollows in this, since I moved here. And I'm still learning. Do you know where such and such hollow is? Nope. Is that a real thing? Jesus goes to his hometown, he sees the burden of his, of his fellow people, and he realizes it's not just Nazareth, but it's all the little towns around him. So he's going from town to town, hollow to hollow, community to community, and what's he doing, right? He's teaching in their synagogues, he's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, he's talking about why he came, right? Anytime you see the term the kingdom, and it's referred to Jesus, what he's saying is his mission, his purpose, the, the original reason why Jesus came. He's trying to just help people understand. So he goes to their synagogues, and just so you understand, a synagogue is different from the temple. Um, this is important for us to see because um, we're going to run into it this morning. The temple was only in Jerusalem, and there was only one of them in Jesus' day. But synagogues were like these little tiny versions of temples in all these different little towns. So he went from Emporium Alliance Church over to Port Allegheny Alliance Church over to he was going from like little synagogue to little synagogue with one purpose, right? To help people understand why he came, the, the kingdom of God, right? And here's the second purpose, healing disease, every disease and sickness. That's, that's a really broad statement, but like he, he's a frontline worker before we had that term, right? He's going into community after community. He's like an itinerant doctor, community to community, explaining the purpose of the kingdom and healing every disease, okay? And then looks what, looks what happens. Jesus, as the frontline worker, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. There's that word. Town after town, community after community, hurt person after hurt person, he has compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Verse 37, what's he do? Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out frontline workers into his harvest. Now, I know I added a couple extra words there. I know I'm extrapolating a little bit of scripture, but stay with me. I mean, when you go all the way back to verse 35, Jesus was living out his mission, but in living out his mission, he became a frontline worker. He was on the front lines of the hurting and the broken and the lost and the scared and the sick and the diseased. He was on the front lines of those who had had generations of brokenness in their families. He was on the front line of those who had been tormented by demons. Jesus really was our modern day inversion of a healthcare worker on the front lines. But the one thing was different, right? He wasn't doing it on behalf of UPMC or Charles Cole or the Potter County Human Services. 
Jesus was ministering on behalf of the kingdom, this eternal purpose that God had sent him for. And in his ministry, he's just overcome with compassion, meeting person after person, family after family, hurt person after hurt person, and it just wells up inside of him, this compassion, because he sees that they're, like, they cannot help themselves. And then he prays, right? He says to his disciples, and this is almost like he's speaking to you and I, but also praying it out loud. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Okay, I want to go back to this one word, compassion. Because if we miss a biblical understanding of compassion, we're going to miss the whole point of this series, okay? So I want to take this word, and I want to like, take it apart for you for just a minute. Because it's a very unique Greek word, it only happens about nine times in Scripture total. And I don't do a lot of Greek, and you need to know something. <laughs> Some of you guys are like, what is that word? Greek is not, um, this is Koine Greek, it's ancient Greek, and it's not a spoken language anymore, but I'll try. Es blank iste. Okay? That's how I'd say it if I was in Greek class. Es blank iste. This word, compassion, there's, there's some really neat things about um, the language, the Greek language, and that is that it's got a lot more tenses and it's got a lot more nuances than, than the English language. So you can have um, past, present, and future tenses all in one word. You can have past perfect, future perfect, and present perfect tenses. So it's forever in the past, forever in the present, and forever in the future, right? Like there's the verbs can have um, doing verbs and being verbs. Either it's happening to you or you're doing the action, and it's all in the same word, just so you understand. When we say uh, walking, right, we don't know if you're walking or someone's walking next to you or walking past you, but in Greek, when you say walking, right, you know who's walking, when they walked, how long they walked, and, and how perfect they were at walking, right? Like, so we have to take apart es blank iste, right? We got, we got to take it apart because... And I want to make sure I get this right, because it's at the center of, of this whole context. But this is um, a passive verb with an active intonation, okay? So what happens, literally, is that this feeling of compassion, it, it came over Jesus. It's not something that he created, like he experienced it. It came upon him, and then... The next thing you want to know, um, the, I think it's the center section, L-A-N-C-H-N-I, length nigh, it literally refers to um, your inner self. Like in, in some um, other Greek languages and, and other, not Greek languages, but Greek usage, um, it may even refer to your bowels, like that center part of yourself, at the core of who he is. So this feeling came over Jesus at the core of who he was, not just in his head, not just in his heart, but in his very soul, his soul was struck by this feeling of mercy, empathy for the people that, right, and according to the Greek, that required him to do something about it. So that's the difference between mercy and compassion. That's the difference between empathy and compassion. Mercy, we can feel merciful, like, oh, I feel awful, but then you do nothing about it, <laughs> We can feel like sympathy or empathy, like, oh, man, that's terrible. I don't have time to do anything about that, right? The difference between compassion and mercy, compassion and empathy, compassion and sympathy is the very end of this verb. It, it comes with this inflection that requires Jesus to do something about it. He doesn't just feel bad. He doesn't just feel merciful, just as not sympathetic and empathetic. He feels compelled to do something about it. That is what compassion is, and it's such a unique word in the Greek, and it's something that, that I just I want us to understand. Jesus was literally overcome in the core of his being with a desire to show mercy to the world around him. And in doing so, what's he say? He says to you and I as followers of Christ, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Like There are very few people who have this guttural response to the needs of those around them that require them to do something. But when you do, when you do, it's from God. When you do, 
It's for the kingdom. When you do, pay attention. Jesus is paying attention to this like gut-level response to this urgent and deep need to extend mercy and compassion and grace to the world around him. The very same world that was rejecting him, that was questioning him, that only wanted certain things from him, like food and healing. The very same world that maybe didn't have the greatest of intentions, Jesus was overwhelmed with the need to demonstrate mercy and compassion. And then he calls us to do the very same. So as I mentioned, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is just outside of his hometown of Nazareth. He's probably in one of the few villages or hamlets. But if you go back just 13 verses, you're going to see something else that that Jesus says that's really reinforces why we have to understand the compassion of Christ that is available to us through the Holy Spirit. He says in Matthew 9, 13, this is just like literally about 13 verses earlier, but go and learn what this means. He's talking to his disciples. He's saying, go and learn what this means. I desire for you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices, for I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. This, this word, to show mercy, is the... I'm trying to make sure it goes right between English and Greek, right? Um, It's the the you do versus I do version of explan iste, right? Remember compassion that Jesus had, that that burden that came over him? He's saying, it's your job then to go out and explan iste, to understand what it means to show mercy, not just to feel merciful, not just to feel compassionate or sympathy or empathy, but to actually demonstrate mercy. And then he goes out and does it, right? So he goes out and he starts healing people and he's casting out demons and he's helping to put families back together and he's preaching the kingdom. And then 13 verses later, he's just overcome with compassion. He's saying what Jesus does is is that he teaches and he models compassion for us in a way that for me is just stunning in a world that is just so hurting and broken at the time, right? He's, He's ministering in Roman-occupied Israel, right? For lack of a better term, and I I don't want to make light of the Ukrainian conflict, but basically Jesus is living in and ministering in our modern-day version of Ukraine, where another country has come in, they've taken over, they're destroying people, they're setting up their way of doing things. And this is what Jesus is trying, this is who Jesus is trying to minister to right now. These are people who are in severe pain. Rome has not been good to Israel at this point. Rome has not been good to the Jewish people. And they're living under all kinds of taxation laws and all these other things about worship and all that. I mean, like, they're just living these oppressive lives. And Jesus is saying, go and learn what this means. I desire for you to show mercy, not just offer sacrifices. Not just tithe on your time or your money but demonstrate mercy, explaniste. This is the calling that Jesus puts upon his disciples and you and I in the midst of a really painful situation in the midst of Israel. Not all that different from what we're experiencing in our world right now. But why? Okay, so let's just pause the narrative for a moment and ask the question, why does this matter so much to Jesus? Why does the demonstration of mercy and empathy and sympathy matter so much to him? Right? Yes, he's doing it in everyday life. Yes, he's healing the sick and casting out demons. And yes, he's preaching. Right? He's doing all those things. But I believe it's a much deeper reason. I believe that, the, that Jesus is desperate for his closest followers to demonstrate compassion because when we demonstrate compassion, we are demonstrating God himself. Okay? I'm going to say that again. When you and I demonstrate altruistic, genuine acts of compassion empowered by the Holy Spirit, what we're doing is we're demonstrating God himself to the world. And let me show you all the way back in Exodus, okay? So let's rewind a couple of, it's probably a couple thousand years, at least 1,500 years at this point, back to when Israel had just been taken out of captivity, right? They just came out of Egypt, and you remember the 10 plagues, and you remember the Red Sea parting, and all the 
the Egyptians dying in the water, right? And then Moses is taking the Israelites to the promised land, okay? That's the context. Are we here? Way, way back, 1,500 years before Jesus said what he said in Matthew chapter 9. God says to Israel this, right? God says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. So he's talking to Moses. He's about to reveal himself to, to Moses for the first time, to show Moses who he really is. I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Okay, so there's a hint here. God's choosing to demonstrate compassion. God's choosing to demonstrate mercy. Do you know what this is? For some of you who've spent some time in Exodus chapter 33, do you know what has just happened in Israel? Israel has just fornicated themselves by creating this huge golden God that, that doesn't have anything to do with the real God, and then they like worship that God as Moses was up on the mountain. So Israel just turned their hearts completely away from God, followed after a false God made out of this golden calf, worshiped and bowed down to it, had a party around it for about a week, and then Moses comes back, and he is dumbstruck by the unfaithfulness of Israel. And this is when God says, I'm going to choose mercy. I'm going to choose compassion. And it's my decision, right? I love that line. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God's telling Moses, like, I choose who gets mercy. I choose who gets compassion. And this isn't the only time he says it. Just a couple of verses later. And he passed in front of Moses. So he tells Moses what he's about to do, right? He's about to show him his goodness. He's about to show him his grace. He's about to show him his mercy. He's about to show Moses, Moses, Moses who he really is. God's about to show Moses who he really is. He tells him what he's going to do, and then he does it. He passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, compassionate. Explaniste. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. You see, the reason that Jesus was so insistent on our demonstration of compassion to the world, because when we demonstrate Holy Spirit-inspired compassion, we're demonstrating God himself. This is the first time God says who he is to Israel. And he says, I am compassion. I am mercy. And I choose mercy. And I choose compassion. This is at the core of who God is. And this is why compassion is so necessary. This is why Jesus calls us to go and learn what it means. That I desire mercy, not sacrifice to raise up the workers who will show compassion. Compassion is the heart of God. Compassion is what brought Jesus into the world. Can I say it this way? Jesus demonstrated the ultimate act of compassion on the cross so that we might trust him and then demonstrate his compassion to others. Do you understand how much trust it takes to choose to to show compassion to someone else? And do you understand how much trust it takes to receive compassion from someone else? To trust that they have your best interests at heart, that they really care about you and they're not doing it for their own self-serving reasons? Trust is so connected to compassion. But Jesus demonstrates the ultimate act of compassion on the cross so that you and I might trust him and then go and demonstrate that compassion to the world. We are the conduits of compassion of God. As followers of Christ, you and I are the conduits of compassion of God in our everyday lives. All because Jesus chose compassion. When it would have been easier to say no. When it would have been easier to walk away. When when it would have been easier for God to just wipe out a couple million Israelites in the middle of the desert after they had wandered away from him. Over and over and over, God chooses compassion for us. And then Jesus calls us to demonstrate that same compassion. That gut level, core of your soul, have to do something about this pain around me. But not on your own, dear friends. Be careful here. Because this is where the, like, the self-help and the, you know, I'm important, I got this figured out, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to show compassion. It's easy temptation for us, especially people like me that have spent their whole lives 
and kind of frontline work, right? Where my identity is tied in the amount of pain that I can endure and, and the amount of people I can help. <laughs> that, just so you know, that's me, if you want to, if ever wondering. Most of my identity and most of my insecurities lie around the amount of pain I can endure and the amount of people I can help, right? So be careful here that what Jesus did on the cross was demonstrated the most beautiful, eternal form of compassion so that we would trust him and then be empowered to demonstrate compassion to others. And this is why compassion matters in this season in the midst of so much compassion fatigue. But what do we do? So, uh, let's bring it back to modern day. What do we do after a two-year pandemic? Well, we fought over just about everything, and we continue to fight over just about everything. I feel like every time I log on to social media, it's another thing we're going to fight over. Oh, we're fighting over that now? I didn't, I didn't know. Thanks for letting me know. That's the new fight. Right? It's like we, we all put on these gloves, and we just decided, you know what? I'm going to fight my way out of this pandemic. Now we're out of the pandemic, and we don't know how to stop fighting. And the compassion is killing us. The lack of compassion is killing us. So that's the goal of the series. The goal of the series is, I, I wish in the seven minutes I had left, I could tell you how to do this, that I could tell you in seven minutes or less how to live out the compassion in, in a compassion fatigue society. society. I can't. But it's my prayer that over these next five weeks we'll learn it together. But I do want to share two verses with you today before you go. These two verses will be the core of the next five weeks. And these two verses have the beginning of the answer of what it means to live the compassion of Jesus Christ in the world around us, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Oh, yeah, I forgot. How's your compassion fatigue, right? Like, this, this is what we're in, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 1 addresses compassion fatigue. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 4, this is Paul speaking to the church at Corinth fairly far into his journey as a missionary, right? This is pretty late in his life. He's friends with the people of Corinth. He's had problems with the people of Corinth. They've been fighting over a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe it had to do with politics, or maybe it had to do with gasoline, or maybe it had to do with diapers. Who knows, right? I don't know if they had diapers back then. But Paul's coming out of this season where he's fighting like crazy, both for and with the people of Corinth. He's trying so hard to help them understand. This is what he says. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the very part, very first part of this letter that Paul's writing to Corinth. The Father of compassion. What does that sound like, please? What does that sound like? Exodus, maybe? 33 and 34? I am the God of compassion. I am the God of mercy. I will have mercy on who I have mercy on. Like Paul is appealing to this reminder, this truth, this core of who the, the Jewish people are to understand that God is the God of compassion. Praise be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort. Whoa. This is, this is another word. Um, the, compassion is explaniste, right? That's the one in Greek. And then when you get down to the word comfort, it's, um, it's really like, the best way to describe it, it's um, compassion and action. And the word is uh, paraklesos. Paraklesos in Greek means comfort or compassion. Um, do you know another word for the Holy Spirit in Greek is paraclete? It literally means to come alongside, to, to bear another's burdens. So what, what Paul is saying, he's appealing to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us, right? So there's three different verbs that are, that are happening here. Uh, well, versions of a verb, right? God is, we've got comfort. God's comfort is comforting us so that we can comfort those around us. It's parakleos, parakleon, and parakleon. So we get comfort. God is the author of all comfort coming to us so that we would be the conduits of comfort, compassion, mercy, and grace to those around us. And then he goes on for like somewhat, at least another like five or six verses, but then you could argue for, throughout the rest of the letter to explain what compassion looks like in the midst of compassion fatigue, to explain what it looks like to show mercy and grace to a world that may not deserve it. 
So these, the core truth I want us to see and understand this morning is that I'm not asking you just to be nicer to people around you. I'm not asking you to just to, have, to feel more merciful, right? To have more sympathy or more empathy. That would be like pretty self-generated and it wouldn't last very long and you'd be pretty mad at me at the end of the series. What I'm inviting you to do, what I'm asking you to do, what I'm begging you to do with me is to tap into the God of all comfort who comforts us so that we could comfort those around us. Compassion cannot come from us. It must come from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus demonstrated the ultimate act of compassion so that we might trust him, so that we might lean into his compassionate love and grace and then share that compassion with those around us. I like the way that um, his name is Nabil Qureshi. He's an alliance pastor. And I love the way he describes uh, the effect that the compassion of Christ on has, has on us. He says, renewed by the restoration of Jesus, renewed by the restoration that Jesus has brought in us, we desire to lift up the abused and restore the broken. He transforms our hearts and we in turn are empowered to transform the world around us. Friends, that is what it means to tap into the compassion of Christ. That, that first, compassion has to be in us before we come through us. Compassion has to be applied to our everyday lives before we can pour it out on the lives of those around us. It starts with the restoration that Jesus is doing in us. And the more we understand the restoration that Jesus is doing in us through the cross, the more that we long to lift up the abused and the broken around us. But not in our own selves. Not by our own power, but being transformed and empowered by the Holy Spirit to the world around us. I don't know about you, but I want this for my life. I want this for my marriage. I want this for my, my kids. I want this for my family. I want this for my community. I want to see the world around me being transformed by the compassion of Jesus. And I can't do it alone. So here's a recommendation for you. I'm closing with these words. My challenge for you, okay? And this week, would you read at least once 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 11? That those first 11 verses in Corinthians, and would you pay attention to the number of times that Paul uses the word God or Christ, okay? Because compassion that is not Christ-centered is not compassion, friends. It's not. Compassion that is not Christ-focused, Christ-empowered, Christ-directed is not compassion. It might be self-serving. It might be like, hey, I'm, I'm going to be nice to you, so you're nice to me. I'm going to be nice to you, so you think I'm a nice person. So take some time in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, read through this idea of compassion and comfort in this next week. And notice how many times that Paul uses the term God or Christ or Jesus or Spirit, right? Refers to God in just those 11 verses because genuine compassion is always Christ-centered, Christ-empowered, and Christ-directed. And then after you read, I want you to ask yourself three questions, if you would, please. And here's your three questions. In your own life, what are your sources of compassion? Who do you go to? Where do you go when you need mercy, empathy, grace? Write them down. Is it people? Is it places? Is it things? Is it podcasts? Is it books? Right? What are your sources of compassion? That's the first question. Second question is, is that source of, of compassion that you have in your life, is it producing in you compassion towards others? Right? It, it, wherever you go to find empathy, grace, Mercy in the midst of your own pain, is it inspiring you, empowering you, compelling you to share that compassion and grace and mercy with other people? And here's the last one. What, if anything, and I mean this, what, if anything, needs to change about either your source of compassion or your demonstrations of compassion in your everyday life? I think, as we talked about at the beginning, we, this idea of compassion fatigue and the hurt that we're all walking through, if we're honest, many of us, we're pretty low on the compassion fatigue scale. And I, I believe that God's asking us to lean into 
the compassion of Jesus Christ. But it starts with asking the question, where do I go when I need compassion? And is that compassion actually inspiring, compelling, encouraging, empowering me to show that same love and mercy and grace to the world around me? And if not, what needs to change? Is it my source? Is it my willingness to share that compassion? Right? What needs to change? Because Jesus demonstrated for us the most significant form of compassion that the world has ever known so that we would trust him and become conduits of his compassion to the world around us. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we, um, we pause at the beginning of this series. And we invite you to search our hearts today. Jesus, we invite you to look deep within. Would you help us to see ourselves as you see us? Would you give us the courage to be honest about where we are in our own compassion fatigue? And would you awaken our hearts to the truth that is in your word? Would you pierce our souls? I mean that, God. Would you pierce our souls with the reality that you are the God of all compassion? You are the God of all mercy. And that you're calling us to be conduits of that compassion and mercy today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.